can you hear me just fine? Yes. I thought that we could be grounded in um, the magical voice of Jayanti, who is a local musician and artist right here fighting for Black lives every single day. Welcome. I want to start this conversation with thanking each of you, Lissa, Candace, Leslie. I, it is not lost upon me all that each of you are holding at this time. Um, so I want you to know that I honor you. Uh, I am inspired by you. I am so thankful for you. And I hold you and ask to be held by you. Uh, to the 700 plus folks joining us from Minnesota and across the country, I also welcome you to this virtual space we have created together. My name is Lulit Mola. I am uh, the Vice President of Community Impact here at the Women's Foundation of Minnesota. I am also a um, member of this beloved community that is St. Paul, Minneapolis, resilient, uh, loving, um, and strong at this time. Uh, the foundation has created this conversation, or I should say it's facilitating this conversation. Um, because in this moment of um, all of us living at the intersection of a pandemic um, and heightened racial injustice and anti-Blackness, it is even more imperative to invest in gender and racial equity. Uh, so part of that is making sure as the nation watches Minneapolis, we amplify the leadership, the vision, the activism, and the narratives of Black women, which is why we have framed this as the genius of Black women, because that is exactly what is unfolding before our eyes, as it always has, and as it always will. Uh, our call to action to each listener today, and I know we've talked about this, is to listen to Black women, trust Black women, follow Black women, and really recognize all that is taking um, to be for, for all of the transformation and change um, happening before our eyes. So some quick technology before I hand it off to the brilliant Lisa Jones. Um, we are asking you to utilize the chat to interact with us and with each other. Um, we are monitoring it though, making sure there are no hackers. Um, so if we do see that, we'll simply turn it off. Um, at the end, we will take a couple of questions. So, uh, so if you have some questions, make sure uh, you're putting it in there. And lastly, um, this conversation is being live streamed on Facebook. Uh, so if you wish, please go on there and share it for your network to tune in. And we'll also be recording it um, so we can invite more people into, into this learning as well. So with that, I want to hand it off to... Uh, the Lissa Jones. She is the creator and host of uh, Urban Agenda on KMOJ, also the creator of the Black Market Reads podcast. Lissa, I know you got us. I know you, but like when I hear Urban Agenda in my car, I don't even leave until it's done. So I, I am here for this conversation. I need this conversation. And with that, um, please, please take, take it over. Bless you. Thank you, Lulit. First of all, you know I'm holding you. And I'm holding Candace and Leslie, too. And I'm very excited to get into this conversation because I'm among the most brilliant of Black women. So let's go right to it, shall we? Yes. All right. Candace, you here for all of it? You ready? I'm here for it, yes. All right. All right. Candace is a visionary by profession. This is so beautiful. You are the director of the Black Visions Collective, yes? Yes, that's correct. All right, will you tell us a little bit about the Black Visions Collective? And at this incredible time, Candace, you have yeah. come up with a new vision for what safety looks like in America for Black people and really for all people as a result. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Black Visions is a Black-led queer and trans-centering or community organization. Um, we started in um, the fall of 2017 and really come out of the movement for Black Lives um, in calling, you know, calling for an end to police brutality, police violence, and um, calling out anti-Blackness in particular. 
Um, and the work that we've been doing for the last several years has really been calling to divest from the Minneapolis Police Department um, and invest in community-led safety, as well as the other things that we know keep us safe. Um, and just like bringing Black folks together, you know, um, for, for the culture, um, honestly, yeah. Bringing Black folks together for the culture. I can dig it. I love that. I love it. Thank you, Candace. Good morning and welcome. Thanks for having me, y'all. Absolutely. Leslie Redmond, you are the youngest president of the Minneapolis chapter of the NAACP, and your name is synonymous with worldwide fame. I see you everywhere on the television, on radio, you and Candace. I mean, it's beautiful to behold. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you so much, Queen Lissa. I'm so delighted you're here. Will you tell us a little bit about your work as the president of the NAACP? What are you working on right now, Leslie? Yes, first I just want to say thank you all so much for having me here today. My sister Lulee, who I love and have so much respect and admiration for, Queen Lissa, the Queen. Queen Lissa is just all I need to say about her. And Candace, I'm super excited about the work that you're doing. We were just on a town hall just a couple months ago about Minnesota Trust Black Women. And so I just think God is bringing this thing full circle and I am thankful and humble to be in this position. So again, my name is Leslie E. Redman. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the president for the Minneapolis NAACP, also known as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. I'm also the founder of a campaign, Don't Complain, Activate, which some of you may have heard of. The idea is that you don't have to be President Barack Obama or Beyonce Knowles Carter in order to activate your community. You could be a teacher, you could be a mom or a dad, you could be an artist, you could be an activist and lawyer as myself. There are so many forms of activation, you just need to pick one. With my work with the NAACP, where do I begin? We are doing so much. Um, in this season, we do whatever we are called to do. Uh, we've been on the front lines, meeting with Chief Arredondo initially when after the murder of our brother George Floyd and making sure that justice prevailed. Um, I always want to thank Chief Arredondo for his exceptional leadership. Um, you know, I think we have to acknowledge that policing really stems from slave patrol and the fact that you now have a black man as a chief. Um, there is a lot of backlash and a lot of white officers who couldn't dare think of Black people as a human, nevertheless, a supervisor involved. And so the fact that he is the first one holding officers accountable in Minneapolis, I think it just speaks wonders and I appreciate his leadership. And I'm thankful that all four of those officers got fired. And now Attorney General Keith Ellison has charged those four officers and we have just been supporting that work. Um, one of the other things that came up was safety about the community. And so we started a Minnesota Freedom Riders where we called on black men and women patrolling the North Minneapolis community. Um, it's been really great. The brothers were really shocked and surprised that the police were harassing us. And we were actually allowed for the first time in a long time to protect our community the way we see fit. And so now we're branching off and creating actually a community patrol and protection company, which we have a GoFundMe out for right now. And if all of you all could donate, that would be great. <laughs> okay, thank you, President Redmond. I appreciate it. You know, one of the things that is true is that there has always been diversity and complexity in the Black community. One of the myths we are up against is this idea of the monolithic Black community. We all think one way about how to solve problems, that kind of a thing. I know that it is, um, it's almost impossible to be in the city of Minneapolis or St. Paul and not be talking about what is our strategy around police safety. But today, I want to really focus on the genius of all four, all three of you. I shouldn't say all four. I don't know if that was a Freudian or what. Forgive me, world. But the three of you. Luli, this was your idea to center on Black women, invest on Black women, be concerned about Black women, follow Black women, share your vision with us as we go forward in this conversation, because I want to hear from Candace and Leslie about how they see investing in Black women and centering Black women. Why is that critical to their movement? Why is it important to them? So I'd like you to start by telling us, what was your vision? How did this come about? I appreciate that. And it, it is for Lissa. Um, we, we recognize your contributions um, as a communicator and an amplifier of stories and narratives and learnings every um, single day. Uh, while I am whole, like um, catalyzed this conversation, I do want to recognize that each of us um, 
talk about the genius of Black women every single time we're together. Um, we always talk about the work of Harriet Tubman, the fact that she was a time traveler, right? Thinking about freedom, imagining freedom in a time it seemed impossible. And uh, we often think about heroes uh, like her from the past. But really, every time I'm in community, every time I'm in meetings with women like Candace, like Leslie, like yourself, like um, there's so many in our community, it feels like I am amongst tra time travelers. Um, the vision, the ideas, the strategy, the tactic, often, especially when we're talking about young people, we think... Um, we think mainstream things is more chaos, right? Less strategy, when really so many sleepless nights went into the one protest that we see, or the one, you know, the organized demand at a, at a meeting. Um, uh, so many years, so many people, so much listening, consultation. Um, so really this, this genius is recognizing that Black women have the answers and have been leading, um, but really are we as a collective, as a society ready to listen, ready to follow if we're truly about that change. So that, so that is what catalyzed this conversation today. I'm thrilled we're having it. Thank you, Luli. I think that's really, really important. And Candace or Leslie, one of you could pick it up. You're, we're all Black women and we suffer <laughs> what all Black women suffer, no matter how genius and extraordinary we are. Candace, when you started your introduction, you talked about centering your organization on, on a certain kind of person. Please expound on that for us. Why was it important to center on that kind of person, that specific demographic? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that one, oftentimes um, it's easy to erase the experience of Black women as well as queer and trans and non-binary folks when we are having the conversation. Hold on one second, babe. <laughs> This is life. <laughs> yes. And you know what? We're like jazz. We improvise. <laughs> they cool it. I bet she told them cool it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, it's the morning here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that like what is really important is um, to recognize that we really have a diversity of experiences when it comes to, to Blackness. And like you said, we are not a monolith by any means. Um, and the, we just like we have to look at the numbers and the ways that Black people are impacted, we have to look at the numbers and the ways that people who live in those intersections of um, sexuality, of gender, of class, um, and, and ability um, are even further more marginalized, you know, like when we were saying Black Lives Matter um, since 2013, we were unapologetically saying all Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And if you can't get down with all Black lives, then you're not here for Black Lives Matter. And that's just it, for real, you know. Um, and so I think that that's really important. And for us, it was necessary um, to do that because, uh, you know, even just my experience here, um, I remember being at the fourth precinct and being told like, get that queer crap out of here, right? Um, unfortunately by black cis men. Um, and I think that we've been sold a lie um, that colonization has really taken us away from our roots um, of diversity, of um, not othering ourselves, but of abundance of all of the identities that we can be. Um, and we need to challenge all members, especially in the black community to recognize that because um, we just won't get free. You know, if we are still willing to oppress each other based off of our identities, um, then true racial justice, true economic equality is actually not possible. Um, and so, you know, that's why. And because the team, you know, who we are, are queer and trans folks and non-binary folks. Um, and so it just felt necessary to make sure that those were the voices that were, were being lifted um, and being centered because oftentimes we are the ones who are at the head of, of this work and um, not written in the history books. And I'm interested in, in changing that. Oh, you changed that. You're going in the history books, Candace. <laughs> I can guarantee you, you are going into the history books, Candace Montgomery. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You are making the invisible visible. We yeah. are a very serious diaspora in a real, real in a real way. And you're saying see us in all of our fullness. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. See us in all of our fullness and recognize um recognize the 
the oppression that we experience across these issues as also being black issues. You know, we are in Pride Month, for example. The people who kicked off Pride, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson was a black trans woman um, who was fighting the fighting directly against the br brutality of the police. Um, and unfortunately, with all of the target rainbow flag, whatever, you know, we don't get that message as strongly that Pride was actually um, a riot against police violence. Um, and queer people have always been at the head of um, fighting against the police because we have also been persecuted um, and killed um, by the police and, or, and or not valued um, in any type of criminal justice system. Um, I think Cece McDonald right here is an example of a, a black woman who was fighting for her life. Um, and because she was trans, she was, um, unfairly persecuted and ended up spending time in a men's prison. That is violence um, outside of the direct violence she experienced in the streets. And, um, you know, that's why I think it's, it's really important. Um, and, you know, just the last thought is like, I grew up with Black women who um, were taking care of family because of an incarceration system that took most of the Black men in my life away. And so I think these kinds of conversations are important because we have to talk about all of the different ways we are impacted. Um, so, yeah. Thank, thank you for asking that. Yeah, thank you, Candace. I appreciate it. Leslie Bredman, who's also going down in the history books. I want to talk about you center on Black people. That I know it's a national association for the advancement of colored people, and you're doing it for everybody, but you center on Black people and Black issues. Why was that important to you in your presidency, considering you were the youngest president we've ever had in the chapter? Yeah. Are, you gained such significant influence. It's just incredible. And I know why, because I know you personally, but just for the listening audience who might not, just go ahead and shine on. Oh, thank you, Queen Lister. So I would say similar to what Candace just said, it's centered in who I am and the essence of my humanity, right? Um, just to give the viewers a little bit of context in the who I am, I am the granddaughter of four African Americans who were born and raised in the South, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Houston, Texas. Um, they were the descendants of enslaved Africans, which means that so am I. They all four on their own migrated to Washington, D.C where my parents were later born and I was born and raised, I, um, they all had about eighth grade, excuse me, they had about eighth grade, I don't know if you all can see me, sorry. They had about eighth, seventh grade education. My parents had high school diplomas. My parents recently have told me to add on that they went to community college at the beginning a little bit because they feel a little insulted. And I try to tell them, the biggest point I try to make is that your degrees does not make you smart or does not make you educated. And so I do think it's important that I make that distinction when I talk about, you know, my ancestors and their history and education. It is not to minimize them, but it is actually to maximize how brilliant they are and how they've gone through hardships that I never had to go through and I don't even know if I could endure, right? Big Ma was one of the strongest, amazing people I've ever met. And she just so happened to be a Black woman, right? Um, growing up in the inner city of Washington, D.C., I witnessed mass incarceration and gentrification on a real note. It was only later in life that I learned these language and these technical terms. And one of the reasons why I even got into being a lawyer was not because I knew lawyers and judges, but because I knew everybody who was being trapped in this prison industrial complex, right? And so for me, I didn't even really, I don't, I always knew that I was Black and I had an appreciation for my Blackness, but it wasn't until I left D.C. that people felt that it was very required for me to know that I was a Black woman in America, right? Um, when I was at St. Thomas, my first year in law school, I was the only Black student in all of my first year classes. And that is when you become very aware of your Blackness, right? When I was in undergrad, while I was at a predominantly white institution, but the Black people, you know, wherever we are, we are going to shine. And so we stuck together and we really changed it. Me and a young guy from the inner city of Chicago, I became the president, he became the vice president of student body. And ever since then, there's been a Black person as the president for that university. And we completely shifted everything. But in that, I want to note it because I was the president for the student body. Since I've been in Minnesota, I've been I would say it's been a part of the condition and the fabric of Minnesota, and then also just something I felt innately that I became the president for the Black Law Student Association. I'm the president 
for the NAACP. And I think that it's very important because I think Asada Shakur talks about it in her autobiography that at some point, we should all just be human beings and be able to fight about whatever issues we want to fight about and be whoever we want to be, wear our hair, how we want to wear our hair. But right now, we have to be so intentional about our blackness. And in a place where is I call it a white Wakanda, Minnesota, you have to be very intentional about your blackness. You have to be very unapologetic in letting people know that I am black and I am not trying to assimilate. And my black people are good, no matter what their education is, no matter what their socioeconomic background is, no matter what skin tone they are, because colorism is real, no matter what hair texture they had. And so for me, seeing the conditions of our black brothers and sisters in Minnesota, it really took a dagger to my heart because I had never seen black people in such conditions, mm-hmm. right? And in a place that is supposed to be the best in America, best education system, best healthcare system, has a more Fortune 500 companies per capita. And yet black people have some of the worst racial disparities. And those are just the numbers, but the experiences yes. of black people in Minnesota made it impossible to ignore and made it very much so my duty, right? Like not a luxury. I tell people all the time, I don't have a luxury because until all of us are free, we are all enslaved. And so I just consider myself a runaway, similar to Harriet Tubman. <laughs> Thank goodness you're running, Leslie. I'm running with you, girl. Lulik, you see in across the country, young women rising up. The, the tale of invisibility for black women is real, whether you're zero or 99, but when you're young, particularly like a Candace, like a Leslie, like yourself, it tend, we tend to get even further pushed down and further erased. What are you seeing on the horizon is happening from young black women like Candace, like Leslie, and even younger? Yeah, you know, when, um, so when, when the uprising started, it happened blocks away from where I live right now. And I went out right away because I knew that I needed to bear witness because it was predominantly black and brown youth that were out there in the beginning protesting, right, exercising their right um, to really demand for justice um, and to really honor uh, George Floyd, who was unjustly killed at the hands of law enforcement. So I needed to go and I needed to witness what they were doing, how they were doing, because I knew once it got to media and mainstream, the stories were going to shift. And what I witnessed were many Black girls, uh, many girls of color, Indigenous girls on the front lines, protesting, leading chants, um, holding spaces for healing, uh, um, amplifying one another's narratives, like um, out there handing out food, handing out masks, and really being um, such a such a vital part of the uprising. And then I also noticed when it came to really um, a lot of the destruction that happened, um, it, it also was not those black and brown youth. It wasn't those girls. They were actually engaging in, in protests, um, uh, in, in an uprising, but not necessarily in the destruction of especially black and brown businesses and organizations. Um, so, and, and I share this to say, um, yeah, girls, girls of color, black girls in this community are, are at the center of our movement. They, we can talk a little bit about organizations like Women for Political Change, led by young women and gender expansive youth, really holding this movement down. We can talk about all of the individual leaders that don't necessarily have an organization, um, but are, are committed, putting their bodies on the line, uh, not resting, right? Not necessarily um, uh, benefiting in any way, but really putting everything they got to demand for justice. So that's what that's what I've been witnessing, and it's important that I share this because, again, once the narratives start to get amplified, once this this uprising starts to go into mainstream, we either erase these youth or we talk about them in a matter that is actually not a fact. Yes, and we do not talk about our youth in terms of hashtag say their name. We want to talk about youth in terms of what they're doing. Candice, you're vibing. Go ahead, take it away. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that is like such a, a, a critical thing. And as a older young person now, you know, I, um, I want to, I want to recognize that, like, when we say 
um, youth, we are really talking about folks who are in high school or just got barely out of high school. Um, and it is folks who are under like 23 um, who are doing this work. And um, I think like continuously, like we have to figure out even as the older young people, how to like actually lift them up um, and how to do that with integrity and a lot of love. Um, and I think that like, what has been really important to me to see over the last um, five years is how do we also intentionally support their leadership development? Because no one else is going to, you know, Lolita and I love to jam about this because uh, we run, you know, we run a young woman's um, leadership program at the Women's Foundation, the Innovators Program. And um, we know that oftentimes if young women, um, you know, are able to articulate a particular thing or whatever, especially in Minnesota, they'll be tokenized. Um, and so I think that um, for... Mm -hmm. For youth, um, our our responsibility as older young folks and and older um, is to also to be a mentor, to be a coach, um, to really agitate folks to um, be developing their leadership. Um, and so I think it's both supporting them, um, not just by following, but also offering um, some direction in, in some ways um, and offering some mentorship in some ways. I think that that's really necessary. Um, and yeah, it continues to be younger folks. And I think what we are seeing right now um, and have been really since 2013 is a changing of the guard. Um, and that guard um, does not look like the people who are on this panel, you know, they are not women oftentimes, um, they are not queer, they are not non-binary, um, they are not, you know, putting, pushing for a radical left politic, um, but we are seeing that change and I think that that's what is really exciting about Minnesota right now is that also while some people are pushing back, a lot of people are embracing it because they see um, the vision that I think all three of us see um, of true, like what true liberation can look like. Um, and I'm excited for those folks to follow us. I am thrilled that you brought that up because when we come back, you know, in a minute, in the next question, I want to follow up on what is your vision for our liberation? Because I think that is part of Black genius, Black women's genius, constantly reinventing and thinking about ourselves in new ways. And Leslie, you were shaking your head like you were digging that when Candace was talking about, what were you thinking? And so it was two things. Just even starting with Lulee, when she began to talk, you all know I was just talking about like Black people and the the need that Minnesota has on our necks as Black people in Minnesota. That very much so exists when it comes to Black women. And mm -hmm. I didn't talk about that, but it's so real because for a lot of the Black men who are my greatest allies when it comes to race relations, they give me so much pushback when it comes to Black women and Black women leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we don't talk about it enough, but people still feel like Black women have a, a role to play, and that's typically inside of the house, not outside of the house, not very vocal, and Black women are still treated as the mule of the world, and we get no acknowledgement or recognition for it, right? And I've experienced that with my own leadership, Louise you know, can testify to this because even with this community protection and preserve, preserve, um, protection and patrolling that we're putting on, you know, there was a Black man that tried to co-opt that movement, right? And as Black women, we are constantly protecting Black men. And my focus, I'm very guilty of it. I don't like calling out Black people in general, and I don't like calling out Black men or women. And so to a certain extent, we protect them, but it also hurts us, right? And so... I think that that's something that really needs to be talked about is the needs that are on the necks of Black women and how it goes about invisible. If you, you all probably read the book, The Invisible Man, we need the invisible woman looked at because a lot of the time we are invisible. When I think about Harriet Tubman and he's saying being a runaway, you know, enslaved African still on American soil, when I was out there leading these Black men to help them protect their community, I cannot tell you how many people asked me to go in the house and did not feel like I should be out there and leading the charge. And I really want to challenge people in the way they think about Black women and the roles and the positions that we are supposed to take, right? Harriet didn't fight all those years ago and go on all of those trips and lead all of these military groups for us to then just tell Black women, this isn't your role. Because in fact, this is our role. And in fact, when everything goes down, Black women have to protect them, their households that we always have had to. And so for me, a part of liberation is 
not just listening to black women and providing a platform for black women, but actually supporting their leadership, right? Um, again, like I appreciate so many people like Lou Reed and Candace and Queen Lisa. You are all people who help to elevate the voices of black women and not just elevate our voices, but compensate us and help provide resources, right? Like that's what we need, right? I can listen to myself talk day and night, but provide platforms where we're not just continuing to work for free labor or we don't have to go begging people for resources, right? Being willing to share your privilege and your resources with black women, not being afraid of black women, because a lot of the time we know that America fears black men and their physical abilities and, you know, they're just nature. People in America really fear black women. And a lot of the time it's simply our voice. Us just speaking out against injustice could get us lynched for public display. And we don't even talk about it, right? And so many black women are suffering in silence. And we know our sister Zora Neale Hurston said, if we are silent about our oppression, they will kill us and say we enjoyed it. And so Stop silencing Black women. Stop putting your knees on our neck. Allow us to lead the way we see fit. Don't just want a Black face and then want to tell her what to say. No, embrace us holistically and embrace all of us, even the ones of us that disagree, right? Yeah. I have a lot of respect and appreciation for all Black women, no matter if we disagree or not. And I respect the fact that we can disagree. That is a part of being a human being. Absolutely. You know, that's part of what, oh, Lulee, go ahead. I, this is, go oh, ahead. I'm, I'm just praising, I'm saying, yes. yes, absolutely. I've witnessed Leslie at the center of a mostly um, men community patrol group holding it down, even at times when we were in danger. I went home after the first night, Leslie, because you know, I was like, all right, time to go home. <laughs> Leslie stayed, and she stayed night after night, just holding so much. So I, I appreciate you. And so many ways and while the world may deem us invisible we know we are not and we are very much visible um, in this time i also want to lift up brianna taylor's name and all of the women who also die from state sanctioned uh, violence either directly or impacted by it by the loss of um the men in their lives i want to lift up a uh, trans woman who also who also die um disproportionately and all of the ways those those subjects are not talked about as we are talking about a change in our criminal justice system as well. Beautiful, Luli. Thank you. You know, I saw in the chat function just a moment ago about, Candace, somebody asked about, what do you mean when you say tokenizing? And I just want to contribute, I'm going to ask you, but I would like to contribute my perspective if you don't yeah. mind at the moment. As a Black woman in radio, you know how rare we are. So anything I say, it's hyper blown up. Right, but I get called as a token for everything for Black History Month. Sometimes, mm. <laughs> sometimes for Women's History Month, if they think I'm relevant as a Black woman, but Black person. And then when I am Black, I'm the only one on the, the call, the board, whatever, and everybody wants to know what all Black people think, Lissa. And Lissa only knows what Lissa thinks. You mm -hmm. did? Candace, what about you and tokenizing? What's been your experience? By the way, I was the only black person in my entire class from ninth to 12th grade at the Blake schools. Yes, I did say it, the Blake schools, ninth to 12th grade. I'm the only one you did. Lonely doesn't cut it. Go ahead, Cam. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that you really, that is like so much of it. That's a particular dynamic. And oftentimes what, what it really looks like is, okay, we're gonna let a few of you up here, right? We're gonna let a few of you get, not even through the glass ceiling, but like right under the glass ceiling and that's gonna be enough. What do you mean we're not racist? We have a black X, Y, Z, right? Um, you know, I think even like, unfortunately the um, dynamic with Chief Arredondo, like I do appreciate the ways that community is lifting up um, his presence as the first black police chief. And I worry that um, oftentimes that is even a tokenized, um, uh, tokenized role because it still is inherently a role that is living inside of a deeply racist and um, institution. Um, and we have to really call, call that out and, and, and pay attention to that. The other thing that I like think about when I think about tokenization versus like leadership um, is I don't want to just be at the table. 
I want to run the table. It is. <laughs> I want to set the agenda. I want to keep the time. Um, and I want to make sure that the notes are processed very clearly and through the, the mouths of Black people um, and especially Black women and trans and non-binary folks. And so that is what we mean by tokenization. Folks are always willing to have us at the table. They are not willing to hear what we got when we bring it to the table. And that's what um, what needs to be shift is us actually leading the table so that we can bring other leaders along with us. Um, and I think just to your other question, it really connects to my vision of liberation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that for Black Visions, we have always um, believed and our mission is really to build connected Black communities that have autonomy and that, that safety is community led. Um, right now in this moment, what is really clear is we have an amazing opportunity for transformation. Um, we have an amazing opportunity to build life affirming institutions instead of um, what we currently have. Um, and so, you know, I have to be clear and every platform I get on, when I say defund the police, I mean defund the police, abolish the police. I don't want, as I told <laughs> Jacob Fry, I don't want no more police, right? And I don't want police in nice t-shirts, um, still toting around using escalatory, um, escalatory systems of violence um, to address harm. My vision for liberation, my vision for safety really looks like um, one, making sure that folks have what they need to survive and to stay safe. Oftentimes people compare communities um, that are less policed, which have less crime, but what else is in those communities? Quality jobs, education, access to housing, access to food. Those are things that keep people safe. And I wanna name that because I think oftentimes, especially as a young queer person um, and as a radical person, um, you know, this demand seems unrealistic or they're saying, well, what do you want instead? That is what we want instead. We wanna defund the police, we wanna abolish the police so that we actually have the space and resources um, and even safety in our streets to dream about how we actually offer real safety to ourselves and to our community. Um, and the second piece is really figuring out alternatives. Um, you know, folks are always like, what happens it, with the murderers and the rapists? What I will tell you all, and I think women know this especially, is that the police aren't tracking down rapists. They're not locking them up. Currently, we have one in the White House and multiple other po high level positions all across this country. That is actually the truth of the matter. You know, people can talk about Kavanaugh and all these things, but then want to say, but, but don't police catch rapists? No, they don't. In Minneapolis alone, we had 1,700 untested kids um, oh, spanning over decades, right? We want to actually make sure that we can build alternatives with folks who are responding with cultural and professional um, proficiency when harm and crisis is happening. Someone will come and someone will come to take care of you if you are in trouble. And I wanna make that really clear. 50% of the people who are murdered at the hands of the police are also folks who are going through some type of mental health crisis. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is ableism, right? That That is what is wrong with our policing system. And those folks deserve care that is appropriate and not someone and someone who understands that they are going through a mental health crisis and is trained as to do so. And that has nothing to do with the police. And like was said, policing is is deeply embedded in a in a racist system in a in a system of slavery and a system of of keeping people in in classes um and so we need to we need to move past it but yeah my vision is really that we are able to build life affirming institutions that actually promote people's safety that we're really able to invest um and understand that there's an abundance of resources we need to get rid of this scarcity mindset you know jeff bezos just became the first trillionaire let's hit him up right um let's hit up a lot of folks um, in actually uh, making sure that we can resource our community. And the first concrete step that we can do is stop wasting trillions of dollars on military and police and start putting that back in our community. Thank you, Candace. James Baldwin said the most dangerous creation in any society is the creation of a man, or in this case, a woman with nothing to lose. If people have nothing to lose, they will do whatever it takes to do whatever it takes. And that doesn't have anything to do with being black. That has everything to do with being human. Mm -hmm. Ladies, we have five minutes, so I'm gonna have to ask you radio style because we're gonna go to, to, to some questions in a few minutes. But I wanna ask, white people keep asking me, what is the role for white people in the movement? 
I go back to Stokely Carmichael in 1966, talking to Mike Wallace, when Mike Wallace asked Stokely, and Stokely said, civilize other white people. I don't know anything else they can do because I can't civilize white people. Nothing I have done, no son I have given up, no daughter I have paid who's paid with their life. Nobody seems to be able to pay enough for white people as a collective idea to divest the ideas of being white. But that's my idea. Well, Stokely's, I'm borrowing it. What about the three of you in any order? Who wants to go first? I can start off um, similar to Brother Stokely, Asada, Sister Asada Shakur talked about the same thing, right? Is that we need to be able to spend our time activating, healing, and building with Black people. And so you should go over and help your white counterparts stop looting our community, right? Um, and so I think that that is the most appropriate place for our white allies. And then also to make sure that you are pouring into the Black community, right? I'm really big on pouring resources, funding the work that we are doing. I think that that is an appropriate space. We know when it comes to economic justice, that's a real thing, and we don't have it right now. And I did put a GoFundMe um, in the link below. And so if you all didn't catch that, bing, 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 you can help me support that way. Thank you, Leslie. And you did it radio style. I appreciate you. That's perfect. You know, economic divestment, Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston talked about the economic trap. If a, if a woman can't eat, we can't fight. Candace, please, who wants to go next? Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, Tiss Jones, who is a St. Paul poet, artist, we, we love Tish, said, you know, a Black man has been killed. And, and then protests and uprising has happened, right? Folks have engaged in, in multiple conversations. And then she says, a black man has been killed. Like she keeps recentering as to who has been killed. He called out for his black mom. His, a black woman taped it, right? He leaves behind his black daughter. So I really am calling for folks to understand and center black people, including white people. And this is also a call for the non-black people of color to say, absolutely, it is about racial justice. Absolutely, it is about our collective liberation, right? Because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And it is about recognizing the inherent anti-Blackness that lives in our homes, in our schools, in our places of work, in our social circles, and in every fabric of the society, and really addressing it. So what does that look like? It means listen to Black people, right? And it means don't listen to just the Black people that, that is convenient to listen to. Listen when you're challenged. Listen when you're uncomfortable. Listen when it doesn't serve you. Right? and follow and trust, and also leave Black folks alone. Leave us to, to build with each other. Leave us to have these political disagreements. Leave us to be in what Candace describes as a principled struggle for liberation. Do not write about this story and leave this story out. Do not come in infiltrating and really amplifying some differences that we have, because this is going to be work for the next 15, 20 years that, that is going to be painful, that's going to be hard, that we'll, we'll continue to have to be on. And so, um, so really like that, that's really, that's really my call to white folks. And then to just echo, organize each other. I once heard an organizer say, get out of the hood and go to your family dinner tables and talk to each other and help one another learn. Right, because when, once you do that and once you awake the white moderate, then we can make some progress collectively in this society. Candace, what would you say? I mean, I would say all of those things. I think that you all really hit it. I, the only thing I would add is educate yourself, you know, like knowledge is not necessarily power, but power um, is shaped by the knowledge that we have. And I think that it's really necessary that folks actually dig in, you know, um, and not just like in the things that Louise said that make you feel comfortable, but read the Black radical um, tradition, read Black queer feminists, um, read Afrofuturism, all of these things, um, and actually offer um, yourself. And then um, I think that it's also necessary for white folks to enter into a process of um, truth and reconciliation and therefore healing, 
white folks actually have to get real with the reality that they oftentimes, especially if they're coming from wealth, that is from the direct exploitation of black people, especially black women. Um, and we need to really reckon that white folks really need to reckon with that um, and begin to have those kinds of conversations as well. It's not enough to be angry at your racist uncle at the Thanksgiving dinner table anymore for me, okay? You gotta move him, you gotta educate him, you gotta really trans also call him into a process of transformation. And that's not my work. That is white folks work, um, but it's very necessary work. And so I think that that's also the things that we're talking about when we're saying, get out the hood, go home, you know, and also want to recognize that there are some white folks who do live in low income communities. And I think that it's very necessary for those folks to really understand the connections between um, economic injustice and racial injustice and have those really critical conversations because poor white people have been used as the tool of white supremacy for a really long time. Um, and, and that's just on the history books. You know, I'm sure Leslie could speak to that, but um, I think that is very necessary that white folks really enter into a process of truth, reconciliation and healing as well as follow black people, follow black women. I really agree. You know, you need to own your own stuff. Before you can go tell somebody to take the log out of their own eye, you need to take the log out of yours. And for people who are white, you have to ask yourself, why is it that we fear black people? What is it about black women that makes us terrified when they open their mouth if they don't, if we don't say what they want us to say? If you can't prescribe black life, what happens if you take your knee off of our neck? And do you recognize that the prison you're in is your knees on my neck and you can't move either? Yeah. Lisa, if I may, I also want to say when we're talking about Black women, vision, leadership, imagination, we're also talking about Black families yes. because they are, women are at the center of families. We're at the center of community. So when we invest in women, we're investing in whole families. And often when we're talking about feminism or women's movement, right, it's, it pits men against women. Um, because as a way to, to amplify and elevate women's leadership. But when we're talking about um, a womanist movement, uh, a Black feminist movement, uh, men are inherently, and, and gender expansive people are inherently part of the movement. So if we're looking at the wage gap, for instance, right? So often we talk about um, uh, men make a dollar, white women make 70 cents, black women make 64 cents. Really not taking into account that black men actually make only a couple more cents than black women and are completely invisible. So, so another thing about how, how white folks can position themselves to be uh, allies is really like understanding what a holistic movement for black people is, with black people is. That takes into account the leadership of, yes, queer folks, women, but also whole families, because that's when we will be well, is if our whole families, our whole, our whole communities are well. And I know we'll, we said questions, Lisa, but I invite you to continue moderating um, this conversation because a lot of what we're talking about are actually speaking directly to the questions. Fantastic. Thank you. Can I add something just real quick? Yeah, Candace, you want to go ahead. Okay, Jump cool. on I just want to offer that this call to follow Black women is also for Black men as well. Yeah. <laughs> and Woo! let's hear an unapologetic about that <laughs> because we, we have to work on that that piece, y'all. Um, and that is a conversation that we can have inside of our own communities. But if there are Black men on this call, I want you to also be listening to the, the agitation that these sisters are giving you right now, uh, that are we're giving white folks right now, because those words can be replaced <laughs> with y'all in that, in that picture too, because I've had similar experiences when it comes to Black men act, Xing out my leadership and the leadership of other yep. um, Black folks. And I think that that um, is necessary. Iana D Dior, um, who was protesting, was brutalized by over 30 predominantly Black men. Um, and it's not to say that uh, there's so many dynamics of, in between interpersonal violence um, that are there, but I think it's important to name that if we are truly committed to systemic, to uprooting systemic racism um, and systemic oppression, like all of us um, have to look at our identities and our positions of privilege um, and examine them um, and begin to work against them, and myself included. Yes. That's, I think, one of the... So the oh. only thing... Oh, go ahead, Leslie. Oh, I was just going to say really quick, um, I was having this conversation one time and I was talking about how 
we really need to imagine the trauma, right, that Black women go through when your greatest allies can become your worst enemies in a flash of an eye just because you speak out about your oppression. And specifically, I'm talking about Black men and white women because Black women stand with everyone every time. Anything is going on, we stand with everyone, but the question becomes, who stands with us, mm-hmm. right? And so I just love that that thought and that vision of America having their knees on Black people next, right? Because I think we can see it very vividly. But I want you all to think about when you've seen a knee on a Black woman next. And it's not going to be physically like we saw on Brother George Floyd. It's going to be that Black woman just saying something and someone repeating the exact thing that she said and it's taken as if it was original and now it's something new to slice bread. Mm -hmm. It's that time where you thought that you could touch that Black woman's hair without her permission or touch her body without her permission. It's that time when that Black woman made a point and you made it a point to invalidate her point and undermine her leadership, right? That's what the knees on our neck look like, right? Our brutality looks different sometimes, and sometimes it looks the same and it just gets completely ignored. And I can't mention how many times I've had to stand with Black women who have been brutalized by the police. A lot of the time, I don't know that they're trying to actually kill us in the physical. I think they're trying to kill our spirit, right? Remember, Auntie Sojourner Truth said, ain't I a woman? And I'm still asking that question today, ain't I a woman? And so to Candace's point, I really would challenge our Black men and also our white women to not position Black women as allies in women's rights movement, because ain't we women? Mm. Hmm. I think that's really critically important. You know, Minnesota has a very unique dynamic with whiteness. There are a lot of the Black people who live here are very white, because we are talking about white not as a condition of the skin solely, but as a condition of the mind. And somebody was asking in the chat about resources and links. Maybe we can follow up with Lulit and the uh, the women's Okay, we'll yeah. offer some, some perspectives, but uh, Candace was offering some concrete people to read and concrete books. Ladies, we are coming up on the hour and it's crazy, but how do you want to leave a word in the village? As you know, I like to stay in the village. <laughs> so for all those who are in the village, what's the word you want to leave? What do you want us to think about as we're centering on black women? Let's start with Candace and move to Leslie and then Lulit. Lisa, may I just ask, when may I just add one part to that question? Um, I think often we talk about the power of imagination and vision and how often that is our biggest barrier to actually, to actual liberation. And, and Candace does such a wonderful job um, in regards to that. So perhaps what do you want to leave us with? And what is the importance of imagination and vision to actually transforming Minnesota and this country? Let's do, let's have Lulit's question. It's much better and much <laughs> better fit for you, Candace. And your okay. please go ahead. Thank you, Lulit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, imagination and vision has always gotten us here. Harriet Tubman was one of the most incredible visionaries. Sis really believed in a vision in which pe- Black people were free and carried over 300 of them um, across dangerous territories to um, to actually actualize that vision. So I think that that is really, you know, why I think vision is so important. And because what is clear is that this system does not work for us because it was never built for us. Um, you can pick up any decent history book and find that out with uh, at least 50% of a critical lens. Um, And so I think that it's necessary for us to actually start building those muscles. You know, Um, if you can't close your eyes and just imagine a world without police violence, then I'm, I encourage you, encourage you to do that meditation daily. Um, Honestly, spend five minutes closing your eyes thinking about what does a world look like without police? What does a world look like where nobody goes hungry? What does a world look like when I don't ever have to walk and see my neighbors sleeping outside? That is like, that is actual muscle. Like our brain is a muscle. Um, and under this, uh, under a system of capitalism, under a system of white supremacy um, and patriarchy, um, imagination is strategically taken away. Right, we have seen narrative campaigns, the 1970s and the Reagan administration and the welfare queen. That was a way to distort our imagination about what black womanhood looked like, right? And so we actually have to um, be in deep practice 
um, and be be a little bit scared, be a little bit uncomfortable, um, because if we are if we are not willing to be uncomfortable, we are going to continue to see um, more George Floyd's and Breonna Taylor's and Tony McDade's um, and Philando Castile's and Jamar Clark's and Trayvon Martin's. Um, that is that's the other end of not embracing our uncomfortability, not embracing our fear, um, and not embracing our imagination and our vision for a totally transformed world. Like I believe it, and for the first time, even you know, Lily, I love to jam about vision, and for the first time, actually, in my heart, in my spirit, in my gut, I truly believe that the little young people that are coming up behind me are going to live in an actually very different world. They're going to not understand why we ever had police in the first place. Um, and that is what I see as possible, especially if all of us step into that discomfort um, and begin to practice those muscles. Thank you, Candice. <clears throat> Leslie, I'm sorry, our time is going short. Please, what would you like to leave in the village for your imagination? So the thing that I want to say is before you can thrive, you have to survive. And for so many people living in impoverished communities in, in the inner city, they are focused on surviving. Most people wouldn't believe. I really didn't start reading and dreaming until I left the inner city of D.C. because what we need is peace, right? Once we can get peace and calmness out, because I want to invite more people to be able to dream, right? Like, I don't believe in this talented temp, which is what we have, whether we acknowledge it or not. But we have this small population of people who are allowed to dream and create visions. And I think the world will be a better place if we create a more peaceful environment for everyone to be able to dream. And so I just challenge us today of thinking, how can we create more peace and more happiness and more wholeness for all families so that they can dream and be a part of these conversations? I think that for people like me and Harriet Tubman, I thank God that he planted seeds in us, even in our oppressive community. But there's a lot, there's very hard for a lot of people to penetrate. So I would just leave us with that. My dream is for support in to people in poverty and help create peace and spaces for them to be able to dream. Thank you, dear Leslie. Lulit? I would add on that our imaginations are strategic. They are with tact. You start with imagining and then you go on to plan and to start implementing. And each of us have um, our, our dreams, imagination put into strategy of what we are calling people to, to be in. And so in follow-up to this conversation, we will send the information about Candace's imagination, about Le uh, Leslie's imagination, about the imagination of the Women's Foundation of Minnesota to invest in gender and racial equity so that we can, we can actually activate. We can activate our ideas and really sometimes when, when you when you can't dream, right? It's okay to follow the dream, the dream of others. Um, we know Martin Luther King's "I Have a Dream" speech is one of the most famous in this history. And what he did was he was he was dreaming. And and I just want to say that's not in the past; it is the present. We are living in a moment of transformation. We are living in a moment of a social revolution. And I ask each person on this call to join. If you've ever wondered what you would be. Right now is it, the time is now. Join us and in the various ways we're imagining a new world where women and girls, black women and girls, girls of color, uh, gender expansive folks, all people could truly thrive right here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the country and the world. Lulit, Leslie and Candace are among the greatest our people have ever produced and I am thrilled to have been in your company. I have learned as always a great deal. In the meantime and in between time, in honor of these three black women, I leave you with the thought of Toni Morrison. Before you enter, before you enter positions of trust and power, dream a little before you think. Bless you beauties. Everyone. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Love you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so, Thank you so much everyone. Be safe. I love you. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all. Bye, everyone. That's how the river flows. And from the highest peak, from the depths below, from where my spirit speaks, from the muddy shores, a subtle feeling grows. Here before, right where the river flows, when I walk 
my muddy hair by the banks of the Ganges. I heard a whisper there from my mother, and my mother's mother, they were singing to me. the ocean it's a deepness turning black I could wait in I could let it wash me down feel it cover me never again be found that's how the river flows Not from the highest peak from the depths below my spirit speaks from the muddy shores a subtle feeling grows that I've stood here before right where the river flows from the mouths of the banks of the Mississippi River I will shout and give thanks to the water that's and though by steam they might conquer, I still believe that you will never be taught by the shovel or be given a muzzle. For your mouth is a muscle, by your voice they do hustle. So 